And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Larry Plennert, as Mel said. Larry is a 1978 alumnus who will be receiving a Distinguished Alumni Award tomorrow evening as part of the opening program as a conclusion to our fall festival, which begins this evening. Larry's life has taken a number of fascinating turns. He has been an elite volleyball player on Canadian University National Olympic teams. He's played professionally and competed at CIS, World Championships, Olympic Games. He's been a university coach, a high school teacher, and for the past 27 years, he's practiced as a lawyer in Abbotsford, BC. And it's here that his story comes to us this morning. For the past eight years, Larry has served as an adjudicator of compensation claims for survivors of abuse at former Indian residential schools. Here's the context. In 2007, the Government of Canada and a variety of Christian churches reached a national legal settlement to compensate all former students of Indian residential schools. And that settlement resulted in two key initiatives. The first of which I think is more, has more awareness for us, and it was a public truth and reconciliation process, inviting Indian residential school survivors to share their stories and a terrible, too little known part of our collective story. The second initiative was called the Independent Assessment Process. And it involved private, confidential hearings of over 38,000 claims of serious sexual or physical abuse by former residential school students, any number of whom also chose to share their story within the TRC process and those hearings. The ordinary court system could not do justice to these claims, and so a confidential hearing process was created involving principles of restorative justice and a profound sensitivity to the realities of abuse and Aboriginal cultures. The goal of these hearings was to draw out the experience of the claimant, to assess the claim, and to determine a level of compensation. And Larry has and continues to serve as one of about 100 adjudicators in Canada as part of this process. His work is framed by an ongoing commitment to a theology rooted in reconciliation, restorative justice, and healing. Larry, welcome back to CMU. Please uh, speak to us now. We tested this earlier, so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, thank you, uh, Terry, for those uh, warm words of introduction. And uh, the more you spoke, I, I felt the less I would need to speak because much of what you've said is uh, what I hope to say as well. Uh, but first, I want to begin by acknowledging and honoring our presence on Treaty 1 territory and on lands which before that treaty was formed uh, were traditional hunting and gathering grounds of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, and Dakota Indigenous nations. As Terry said, um, I've pursued various passions over the years since I left CNBC. Uh, that involved uh, passion in music, passion in sport, uh, becoming a lawyer, and now working as an adjudicator, which is my full-time work. Uh, but I have very fond memories of the years that I was here on this campus. Uh, now those are quite a few years ago. Uh, but back at that time, there was two degrees that a student could pursue, a music degree or a theology degree. So uh, when I told people that I had chosen theology, uh, they said to me, uh, they kind of gave me a warning. They said, well, that's great, but look out for 338. 338? What was 338? I had to look into the student calendar and find out this was an upper level course in systematic theology. Uh, so I took that course and uh, had the great privilege of having two, it was co-taught by Doc Schrader and Harry Hubner, two uh, fabulous and distinctive uh, former professors from uh, Canadian Mennonite Bible College. 
And I think in hindsight, I can say that that course, more than any other that I took here, opened my mind uh, to new and important ways to understand God's message. Uh, that course proved to me to be a foundation upon which I began to think about what a theology of peace and justice really might look like. And so now, uh, all these years later, uh, I consider that the theological principles of peace and justice have become critical and core elements of my Mennonite faith, uh, ones that have colored my perspective as to the ultimate character of God. Uh, and as was read through the various scripture readings this morning, there's references to justice throughout the scripture. Um, in particular, the first one that you heard is the one that speaks to me most directly. That one says, God has shown you, Larry Plennert, what is good. And what does God require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So this is the verse that I hold myself accountable to uh, when I conduct my hearings. Uh, and I'll just briefly share with you a bit about that work. An adjudicator is essentially a judge limited to a specialized area. And my specialized area in this context, uh, as Terry uh, highlighted, is dealing with former students of Indian residential schools. About a year ago, uh, the adjudicators, my colleagues that do this work, made a presentation at a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, event in Alberta. Uh, and among other things, that presentation included a description of what the adjudicators' work actually is. And so I want to share some of those words with you that were shared with the TRC about a year ago. Adjudicators question former students and any witnesses that come before us to draw out the full picture of what happened to that person at residential school. We seek to understand any abuse the person suffered and the impact of the abuse on that person's life. We then decide if the abuse suffered qualifies for compensation. We strive to do this in as humane and kind a manner as possible. We see former students arrive for their hearing feeling anxious and wary, and then often expressing relief after voicing what they had suffered at residential school, maybe for the first time. We acknowledge the bravery of each person who makes the decision to speak to us. Listening to people speak about being abused as children is difficult but meeting former students enriches each of us. We see the people who come through our process not only as children who have been victimized, but also as adults who survived by their courage, persistence, adaptability, and creativity. The experience of sharing what is really a spiritual journey into their darkest private experiences affords us a profound connection with people who have suffered across time and cultures. It deepens our humanity and is the reward of doing our work. We know that children were violated, assaulted, and neglected at residential schools, and we see the damage that was done not only to the children themselves, but to their families, their children, and grandchildren. <coughs> we truly hope that our process can be an important step on a healing journey for former students, their families, and their communities. So as these words describe, my work incorporates the principles of restorative justice. Uh, and it's far different than my previous experiences in the courtrooms in British Columbia. The courtroom is a very formal and intimidating setting. Uh, I think all of you have probably seen hard-nosed uh, prosecutors on television. Perhaps some of you have had the privilege of being in a court, but it's very formal, very structured. Uh, can be a very intimidating place. And you could imagine how difficult it would be if you were trying to share about something that happened many, many years ago when you were six years old, 10 years old, 
uh, if people were asking you, you know, what do you remember about your first day of kindergarten? You know, what do you remember about the teachers and the staff at, at your school when you were that young? Uh, it would be very easy for someone cross-examining that person in that formal courtroom setting to trip them up, and justice would never be served. Contrasting to that are the hearings that I do, which are in comfortable settings. Uh, they can be in someone's home, in a hotel room. Uh, I've done hearings in um, prison, in hospital rooms, all kinds of settings. But part of my job there is to transform that room into a place of safety uh, where the victim has a chance to open up and talk about what their experiences truly were. A, a place where reconcili reconciliation and justice have an opportunity to develop. One of the things I can do at the close of each hearing is something that you would never see as well in a formal courtroom and that is uh, an important process that I follow at the end of every hearing. I invite each person who was in that hearing room, and up to that point, it's only been myself and the claimant who have been speaking. So I do all the questioning of the claimant, the claimant answers all the questions, and no one else is involved in that process of the hearing. Uh, but there might be uh, quite a number of people in the circle. And so at the end of the hearing, I invite each one of those people to respond to the claimant. And uh, I wanted to share with you uh, about some responses that occurred in a recent hearing that I conducted in Calgary. Uh, and um, these are confidential hearings. We'll call, let's call the claimant James. Uh, that's not his true name. Uh, but here's a, a flavor of what the final comments were at that hearing. So uh, the claimant's lawyer told James that he had done a really good job. And he thanked him for trusting him to do his legal work for him. A lawyer for the government of Canada offered an extremely moving and personal apology to James. And he said that the shame that James had talked about during the hearing uh, was now the government's shame. And that no child should ever have been treated the way James had been treated when he was a child at that residential school. James' wife was at the hearing, and his wife uh, said to him some unbelievably profound things. Uh, but those included that she now understood why he was angry at home. She understood why he had trouble sleeping at night and had nightmares. He, she now understood why he wouldn't hug their children. And she expressed her continued love for James. And there had been a health support worker at the hearing. And the health support worker complimented James on the strength and courage that it had taken for him to tell his story. And promised that he would call James the following morning just to check up on him and see how he was doing. So these types of responses uh, uh, may or may not happen, but I give an opportunity for those to happen at the end of each hearing. And they become an extremely powerful conclusion to the, the events of the day. But what really stuck with me at this hearing was what James then said in response to these comments. He said that for him, the hearing was about much more than just getting some money his tears began to flow, and he shared that he believed that with the closing of his hearing, uh, this now marked the beginning, uh, the true beginning of his healing journey. Now that he had finally disclosed all of the abuse that he had suffered when he was six years old, he felt he was ready to get some counseling, he was ready to move forward with his life, uh, to become a better husband, and to become a good grandfather to his grandsons. And all of us that were in the, in the room were extremely moved by these words. What an incredible moment of transformation that was to see uh, James ready to start uh, feeling as though he was a new person. So to sum up, my work can be really challenging and the things I hear can be disturbing. But words from courageous men like James makes that work extremely rewarding. In fact, I have experienced a significant union between 
uh, my profession and my Anabaptist faith, and I consider my work to be an extension of my theological beliefs, and in particular, Micah's calling to, do, to love kindness and to do justice. So, in closing, I just want to encourage all of you to consider God's important message of justice in your own life, in your world, and it's my hope that together we can reconcile some of the historic wrongs of our country, and in particular, develop respectful relationships with our indigenous neighbors. Thank you. <laughs>